say that for better and worse. Um, in many ways, awareness about human trafficking has sort of skyrocketed over the last many years, but there's a lot of very intense and purposeful focus on sex trafficking alone, much to the exclusion of people who are exploited and victimized in other labor sectors. What we hope to do with this webinar today is look at the, the entire uh, realm of conduct that constitutes trafficking and trafficking in industries outside of simply the commercial sex sector as often people who are trafficked and victimized and exploited in other labor sectors um, escape detection, don't get the benefit of assistance or services, and face the same hurdles with criminalization um, that are magnified because of our failure to recognize or meaningfully grapple with labor trafficking. So uh, this is an area in which there are not hard numbers and an extensive amount of data um, from which we can draw. At the same time, though, one of the most important studies that's been done on this in recent years was done by the National Survivor Network in 2016. The network did a survey of its members, and 130 survivors responded to the survey. What's important to note here is 91% of the respondents, all of whom are survivors of trafficking, reported having been arrested before. For over 50% of respondents, every arrest on their record resulted from having been trafficked. 42% were arrested as minors, over 40% were arrested nine times or more, um, and 60% were arrested for crimes other than prostitution. In fact, 40% of respondents to the, study, to the study indicated that they had been previously arrested for drug possession. Almost 20% indicated that they had also been arrested for drug sales. What does this information tell us? Well, it tells us that this is a pervasive and prevalent issue that it is not a fluke, it's not a one-off, it's not an inadvertent one-time arrest of a trafficking victim in one jurisdiction, it's happening across the country. Survivors of both labor and sex trafficking, and it's happening repeatedly and systemically. When survivors engage with the criminal legal system, um, what we understand is that U.S. citizen sex trafficking survivors report more interactions with the American criminal legal system than foreign-born survivors. Um, and really, this is where I'm going to direct us to start thinking about who is coming into our criminal legal system as a whole, and what do we know about policing and prosecution patterns and practices across the country. We know overwhelmingly that our criminal legal system impacts communities of color dis disproportionately. We understand that um, the marginalization that can be a, uh, that can give rise to vulnerability that then increases the likelihood that someone will face exploitation or victimization increases um, in certain communities, communities that are disenfranchised based on class, um, based on immigrant status, um, and all of this results in a higher likelihood of criminal legal system involvement. What we also see, though, is that 72% of sex trafficking survivors reported prior involvement with a criminal case as a defendant. And this is closely connected to our, our policing of the commercial sex industry and of prostitution more generally. But we cannot forget that victims of labor trafficking also face arrest. Um, in a study done by the Urban Institute, 14% uh, of labor trafficking victims reported being arrested, most commonly for immigration violations. Um, and 69% of labor trafficking survivors were already in a position of extreme vulnerability, meaning that they were undocumented, had overstayed a visa, or were, were in the country at risk of immigration proceedings, deportation, removal at the time that they were identified as human trafficking victims by service providers. Our federal law, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, actually foresaw this precise scenario. And one of the provisions in the law, going back to its original version in 2000, um, cautions against the criminalization of of trafficking survivors, and the law itself makes clear that victims of severe forms of sex trafficking should not be inappropriately incarcerated, fined, or otherwise penalized solely 
for unlawful acts committed as a direct result of being trafficked. The Department of State has made this clear as a priority in their trafficking in persons report year after year. Most recently in 2018, there was a, a appendix to the report that highlighted the, the importance and the need for government to protect victims from wrongful prosecution and further victimization. So what does this mean for us that are advocating or working in the criminal legal system and where are the areas and opportunities for reform and for harm reduction? Well, the first place that we can look for this is in thinking about who we arrest and why. In most places, this is a difficult conversation to have, but it's one that's already in progress. You know, the years of focusing, for example, on low-level quality of life offenses in jurisdictions like New York City and other major metropolitan areas across the country um, are finally being called in question, right? That policy, that strategy, was that wise? Was it effective? So thinking about who we arrest and why is a critical piece of reducing the criminalization of survivors. Similarly, and this is something where, where Mosaics as a project operates, is thinking about the case adjudication once a case is actually in court. Once someone has been arrested, how do we identify resources for them? What defenses might exist? What are the best outcomes that we can create within the existing constraints of the court system? Is that a diversion program? Is that prosecutorial discretion, judicial discretion? What does that look like? And we're gonna to get to some of that in our discussion today. And then finally, what do we do with people who have been criminalized and are still struggling with the weight of the collateral consequences of that criminalization? How do we um, implement and pass laws that offer relief? How do we make sure people are aware of that relief? And how do we ensure that survivors that have criminal records have meaningful and accessible opportunities to clear those criminal records um, when they're connected to their trafficking? or even if they're not connected to their trafficking. So in order to understand also why criminalization is prevalent and why it's something that we need to be concerned about, we need to think about the victim experience in the criminal legal system and specifically why this isn't how one might imagine um, a situation could unfold where a victim of trafficking comes into contact with law enforcement, discloses the fact that they're being victimized or trafficked, law enforcement responds appropriately and accordingly, and everyone is happier and a great outcome results for all. Um, as many uh, who are attending or participating in the webinar can imagine, that's not frequently the way this plays out. And more frequently what happens are people are arrested, their circumstances remain unexplored, their cases are resolved without much consideration, and this is the problematic functioning that we're trying to attend to. So there are many reasons why um, victims are coming into contact with the criminal legal system and why in the course of adjudicating their cases, their victimization is not coming to the surface. Um, the first is that many people, victims of crime particularly, but just people um, have distrust and wish to avoid the criminal legal system. In many instances, this is because they themselves have experienced prior criminalization. Once you have been prosecuted, once you have been labeled a criminal, treated as such by the police, the courts, the court system, um, sends a very clear message on your value and your worth uh, and your ability maybe to trust in or wish to engage in the criminal legal system. Similarly, many people um, which a group that includes victims of trafficking have had negative experiences with law enforcement. I'll talk a little bit that, about this in, in a couple minutes. Um, and also live in communities that have had negative experiences with law enforcement. Um, here, our policing looks, uh, again, very much consistent across the criminal legal system. And so the way that we see gang investigations or family violence investigated with a heavy hand of law enforcement coming in on communities that may not welcome that intrusion, um, similarities and parallels exist with our investigation and prosecution of human trafficking. Survivors often have concerns about reporting um, their experience accordingly. And a lot of people, very rightfully, have limited faith in the legal system's ability to remedy the harms that they might be experiencing or to prevent other people from experiencing that harm. This is particularly acute for foreign-born survivors of, of uh, crime and trafficking who may be in, in the U.S. with 
different immigration statuses, um, have limited understandings of how our legal systems operate, but more than anything have a very, very well-founded fear of interaction with legal systems because of the potential for separation from families, proceedings, deportation, et cetera. So uh, one of the things that we've heard over and over and over again from some of the survivors of sex trafficking that we work with is their negative experience with law enforcement has created a lasting impact on them and their ability to engage with legal systems. Many survivors of sex trafficking have experienced disrespectful treatment or even sex abuse at the hands of police officers, and many have been criminalized. Um, this is particularly so for, again, more marginalized or vulnerable, vulnerable groups. Thinking specifically about some of the, the transgender survivors of trafficking that we have worked with over the years, um, describing the verbal harassment and abusive treatment that they experience at the hands of police, um, being ostracized, made fun of, othered, right? All of this in the course, usually, of their own arrest. The cumulative impact of this, not surprisingly, is that people do not see law enforcement as a means of assistance and safety, and instead will do almost anything to avoid interaction with law enforcement, even when they themselves are experiencing violent or serious crime. With that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Dahlia, except Mosaic's team, I don't really remember how to do that on the webinar, so someone's going to have to do that. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. I appreciate it. So Kate's exactly right in giving the landscape of where we are with the interactions of our defendant population with the criminal justice system and how they may already feel victimized in that nobody believed that they were actually, say, being trafficked or cared even if they disclosed it. But taking a step back, we know that the impacts of trauma oftentimes led them into the trafficking situation. We know that there's the historical context of what they may have experienced that led to their vulnerabilities to being trafficked. And I know that this is not going to be rocket science for anybody who is listening to the webinar, but I do think that it's very important that we take these impacts of trauma into consideration when we're interacting with our populations. Now, we will not have an opportunity for an in-depth discussion of this issue on this webinar, but there are numerous resources to learn more about the impacts of trauma and how to take that impact of trauma into consideration when interviewing uh, your different populations, whether they be victimized defendants coming into the court system as victims. Now, it's an important skill set to learn and grow, not just for law enforcement and prosecutors like we often see it marketed, but I think also for the defense bar in making sure that there is that trauma-informed interviewing that is being utilized when we are trying to elicit information from our different populations that we intersect with. And so we know that we all interact with traumatized populations, the proliferation of adverse childhood experiences and the correlation to intersections with the criminal justice system. It's just part of what we know we have to deal with. So in talking about that, how can it manifest? What does it look like? And I'm sure each of you on this webinar could come up with specific examples of what you've seen in either if you are a defense, uh, part of the defense bar and clients that you've dealt with, if you are a part of um, the prosecution or law enforcement and victims that you've interacted with, or um, even that cross-intersection prosecutors when you've done defendant interviews and you've seen these different um, characteristics that manifest during the interview. And so we know it comes across in a lot of different ways, whether it be difficulty concentrating, uh, difficulty making decisions, that flashback or preoccupation, um, the memory disturbances. Have we all had that interaction where the uh, person that we're talking to is saying, you know, I don't really remember everything, uh, the changes in hygiene, whether it's the hypervigilance as to the hygiene or whether it's the complete disregard to the hygiene in correlation with previous assault, the sense that things aren't real, worrying, the constant pressing worrying, and the changes in their sleeping and eating patterns and withdrawn and neediness. We also know that can be a lack of earnest resistance, which is one of the things that's oftentimes most difficult for lay populations, even sometimes our bench, to understand that this can be a manifestation of trauma. Um, one of the favorites, I'm sure, of 
uh, the defense is we have a victim who has maybe say crying or um, I'm sorry, not crying, but the flat affect or the laughing on the stand. But we all know that this is a manifestation of trauma, right? And what we have to understand is that how it comes across is not so much a responsiveness to what we are saying, but more so a responsiveness to the recall of what they've been through. Um, and we can go on and on about the different responses that we would see when it comes to being traumatized and how they look. Um, what we know is what we see, especially in our populations that have been trafficked, is that they're going to have continued contact with their offender, which sometimes can complicate our ability to um, elicit, say, cooperation or to elicit resources to try to help with the situation that they may be in. And of course, like Kate talked about already, the reluctance and refusal to participate in the process um, or the recantation or testifying for the defendant. And we'll talk about this a little bit more, but I think that this really highlights these responses, these very common responses to trauma, highlight why it's important that we do have an amicable and working relationship across the lines with the prosecution and the defense. Because what one side may pick up on that the other does not notice can really be the key to not only help the healing, but also to help the proper person be focused on uh, for when it comes to uh, your efforts as a prosecutor to hold them accountable. And so what we know is that our trafficking victims, regardless of whether it's across um, being sex trafficked or whether it's across being labor trafficked, we know that we are not dealing with a clean slate. Um, what we know is that there's going to be a previous history of compound trauma that, again, led them to the situation. And so we know that there's going to be issues of neglect, of abuse, abandonment, um, and just unstable, uncertain home lives or just complete poverty-stricken situations that they feel compelled to this life of tra being trafficked or vulnerable to being led into a life of being trafficked. And all of this is happening before the actual trafficking begins. And so recognizing the disclosures or the barriers to disclosure, like Kate talked about uh, some of these already, is that, you know, we have got to address the elephant in the room, um, especially when it comes from the side of prosecutors and law enforcement, that we have to deal with the intersectionality of race and gender in how we are approaching cases, um, how we are perceiving credibility, how we are perceiving victimization, and that we have to again, um, be very blatant and be very clear as to, for lack of a better term, looking at the person in the mirror, being yourself to say, am I making decisions based on bias or am I making them based on evidence? Um, and we know that what we have are issues where victims are constantly going to self-blame. You know, that ride or die um, that's going to be in the situation that is coming to you from the defense attorney. And so when the investigation was going on, they would say absolutely nothing. Um, and it wasn't until you had time to work with them until they were able to have resources, until the defense attorney was able to really talk them through the process and even understand their own victimization, that you are able to kind of break through some of those barriers. A big one is a fear of not being believed. Again, we talk about the compound trauma and what if there have been numerous disclosures before? What if there have been all these different incidents previously and nobody's ever believed them? So why bother? Why would I even say anything anymore? And so these are all things that we need to take into consideration when as prosecutors, we then have a late disclosure from somebody who has been victimized that is currently charged, um, that it's not a lot of times I think we lend ourselves to the lens of, oh, they're just trying to get out of trouble versus there is a legitimate process to somebody processing their trauma and being able to disclose what has happened to them. And we know that there's different issues like internalized oppression and generational abuse and, and just all these different issues that continuously build up these barriers to disclosure. And not to mention if we have a whole other confluence of issues, whether it be substance abuse. Um, I mean, how many times have we seen our offender population and oftentimes we dismiss maybe claims that they have um, by lending it or blaming it on the addiction and that uh, dissuading their credibility 
uh, when they're part of the offender population or even mental health, same thing. Um, I think that we have to be cognizant of the fact that these vulnerabilities, whether it be substance abuse, whether it be mental health, that these are things that the exploiters are well aware of. And that's why these victims are being targeted. That's why they're taking the fall because the offenders know how easy it is to manipulate this population and to get them to do what they want them to do. And we talked about the culture and, and the impact to trauma and the shame and just the general distrust of the system as Kate referred to. So when we talk about the co-occurring crimes, what we definitely wanna focus on is um, like the on-ramps, how is it that we are seeing our victimized defendants come into our criminal justice system? What does it look like? When are they coming to your caseload? And I'm sure that you all could give plenty of examples of how you're seeing um, trafficking victims that are charged with crimes come into the system. What we see a lot of is domestic violence crimes. Um, this is a situation where maybe they were fed up with the physical abuse and maybe they fought back and maybe their assessment or analysis was on um, primary aggressor instead of predominant aggressor, and that fine nuance of somebody kind of pre-understanding uh, that there is an attack that is imminent and defending themselves from that, and unfortunately, they then get charged and taken into custody. Um, it could be sexual assault. Those who have handled human trafficking cases are well aware that many times we have uh, one of our trafficking victims that has um, perpetuated a sexual assault on another victim within the um, tra sex trafficking framework. Child pornography of the exploiter is the one who's directing the victim to take the photographs of, say, the underage girls that may be brought into the sex trafficking organization. Um, obviously, the organized crime. Um, I know that's something that we were definitely pursuing with uh, some of our sex trafficking cases and cases dealing with escort agencies along those lines of pursuing organized crime ordinances to be able to capture the whole thing. And we as prosecutors definitely have the obligation to separate the wheat from the shaft, if you will, in determining who is culpable in these situations. The witness tampering, who's the one on the jail calls that's always being told to tell the victim to disappear? It's always like the other individual who's equally being victimized within the trafficking scenario. And of course, custody interference. We know that a lot of times, especially in the sex trafficking arena, that it is oftentimes a female trafficking victim that is utilized as the pawn to bring in the other female so that the exploiter is not the one that is um, left out there with that liability. Other co-occurring crimes that we're gonna see our victims on ramp into our criminal justice system is being charged with possession of fake documents, um, the ones that are acting as their drug mule for their exploiter, um, your petty offenses and trespass offenses, whether it be at hotels for labor trafficking, whether it be at certain facilities that they've been told to not come back to, weapons offenses. How many times have we had the version of facts where it's she's holding the weapon in her purse because he hands it to her right before getting pulled over and she takes that charge because that is what typically that loyalty factor is gonna obviously breed in to the manipulation and, the, and then the further exploitation. And the loyalty factor exists regardless of whether it's sex, regardless of whether it's labor. There is definitely a loyalty that exists between the victim and the offender. In labor, it's oftentimes feeling grateful that this person is taking them away from whatever dire situation they may have been living in and bringing them to the States for a land of opportunity. And regardless of how degrading the environment is, they still feel like this was an opportunity. And if just a couple things would change, it would be all different. And so the loyalty is oftentimes what's gonna get them engaged into the system because they're thinking to take the charge. Again, the larcenies and the thefts, whether it be for basic supplies, um, we've had cases where they're stealing, whether it be um, tampons and feminine products or condoms or food, whatever it may be, that there, there's that theft element that again can be a red flag to the different offenses. So talking about culpability, talking about how do you determine? So you've got all these factors that you're supposed to look at. You've got all these different scenarios that you're supposed to look at to see what to do. So how is it that you decide as prosecutors what to do with your case and what role does defense have in helping you come to that situation? Some prosecutors out there may be like, the defense has no role in my decisions as a prosecutor, 
But I would challenge that notion to say that this is a system. And if you are not open to at least hearing what potential mitigation there may be out there, then it, it may be a disservice. Now, I understand that there's always the exception to the rule. Prosecuting for nearly 15 years, I get it. But I would also say that I have had the benefit in working in jurisdictions where we did have a good working relationship with our defense bar, but I know that's not the same everywhere. And sometimes it just takes the ability of separating the personality from the presentation of facts and not taking anything personal when you're dealing with, say, somebody who, and this is whether it's a defense attorney dealing with a prosecutor or prosecuting dealing with a defense attorney, somebody who your personalities may not mesh well. So when we're talking about assessing culpability, we want to ask questions like, what was their role in the operation? What benefits did they derive from their participation? Did they experience any victimization? Because the reality is, as prosecutors, we're not robots. It's not, you know, a lot of times people may function and say, well, it's a black and white issue. There is no gray. When, in fact, you know, prosecutors don't operate necessarily with um, a mallet or um, I'm not up to date on all of my tools, but <laughs> on all the hardware. But honestly, what we do and what we should be doing is operating with a scalpel because there's a lot of fine nuances that we have to navigate as prosecutors in determining how do we seek justice, because ultimately that is our job, is we need to seek justice. And so the beginning assessment of determining culpability, this is a good metric to figure out, okay, where do they lie on the spectrum of culpability? Because honestly, it's not going to be just one side or the other most of the time. Um, we do have rare occasions where, yes, they definitively are 100% victim or they are definitively 100% culpable, but I think most would agree the vast majority falls somewhere in between that spectrum. And that's where this becomes the art and the skill of determining what do we do because what does justice look like in those situations. And so a lot of different considerations can be um, brought up, the age, the relation to others, duration of the trafficking, the violence used or the violence experienced um, can also be important when you're making these decisions. Uh, threats used and experienced, crimes committed, the victim's input is obviously extremely important. Um, the level of cooperation, the willingness to testify, the likelihood of rehabilitation and restitution are all things that you could consider. And I'm sure that you all um, who have been doing prosecution for a while could definitely add to this list of factors that you consider when determining how to resolve any type of case. And how do you get that information? How do you determine the answers to those questions? Well, you'll see first on this list is the defense attorney. Um, the defense attorney is a great source of information for receiving mitigation evidence to determine what to do with your case. Uh, if there's an immigration attorney involved that um, has started, say, uh, proceedings with a defendant, then they could be a great source of information as well, because obviously there's going to be a transparency in that relationship. And um, again, I know as prosecutors, oftentimes we may be weary, especially when there's immigration issues, that the jury is going to perceive that this individual is just claiming trafficking because they just want a path to citizenship. But I assure you, the fast path to citizenship is not by highlighting and bringing a spotlight on yourself um, when you know that your status is not um, where it could be. And that's not what you wanna do. You don't wanna bring attention to your status at that point in time. And, and that's another, a much longer and more in depth discussion as well. But of course, in examining your, your evidence, your victim and witness statements, I'm sure that I am not the only one out there who has had a victim interview and after speaking with my victims, understanding that a charged co-defendant in a trafficking case is actually being equally victimized to the victims that we have named in an indictment. Um, your expert reports to so take consideration of those, the criminal histories of the parties involved, uh, obviously the background investigation, your social worker and your social service providers. I know especially in the sex trafficking cases, everybody had child protection service records. And oftentimes they were not shipped in envelopes, but in boxes. And it's so extensive and can give you so much insight into what's happening. And of course, your psychological, medical, other experts. Um, and then the debrief, talking with other people, understanding that there's uh, 
a lot going on in understanding that you need to have a better grasp of the situation. So I want to just, before moving on to the next slide, have a quick conversation about um, immunity. So I don't know how many different prosecutors utilize this as a technique, but I do think what's an important part of the conversation with your defense attorney is to discuss the fact that you've got to have a conversation about transactional immunity before you bring that defendant in to have a conversation. For us, what we would do is um, utilize a document that we would send to the defense in advance to say, hey, please review this with your client so that anything that they say during this interview would not be used against them absent them admitting to a homicide, um, but that we just want to get to the bottom of it so that we can come up with an accurate assessment of the facts. I have a colleague in her jurisdiction down in South Florida, they called it a queen for a day letter, colloquially, it's those types of things that I think helps you guys, the defense and the prosecution to be on the same page to understand that we are here to actually seek justice and the way to seek justice um, is to make sure that we have the truth of the situation. Now, I would say to be aware for prosecutors that this is like opening up Pandora's box. So once you start these interviews, it, we call these the spider web cases because what you see is that you are constantly having to corroborate even more information. And the issue is not wondering what to investigate next. The issue typically is knowing when to stop investigating because it just keeps continuing to grow and grow and grow. Another tip is to, um, we know that restoration of our victim is very important to make sure that they're getting the resources that they need, even if they're a charged party, and to consider maybe putting those conditions within their bond conditions or their pretrial um, release conditions. And a good way to know what that individual needs is a discussion with the defense. Is it drug treatment? Is it um, some type of counseling? What is it that could help with the restoration of your defendant that has been victimized. The other thing that we wanted to talk about was the possible resolutions. Again, it's a spectrum. Where do they fall on this line? What is it that you can do to help to assist to seek justice? I keep saying it, I know, broken record, but ultimately what else are we there for but to seek justice? Um, and there are times that when you have different players within the criminal justice system that are not equally yoked, and so I think when it comes to awareness of trafficking and the realities and the red flags. And so this, again, is another reason why it's great to have an amicable relationship between the defense and between um, the prosecution so that you all can talk and educate each other. Because sometimes I may see the red flags, sometimes they may see the red flags. And so we have to be able to have enough trust between us that we are able to communicate that as well. The other thing I will say is that do your thorough investigation up front. Um, you would hate to offer some great plea deal to an individual based off of just that initial peripheral interview without doing the corroboration just to find out that they're Kaiser Sose. For those that have not seen the unusual suspects, this is a reference to an individual who was really the mastermind of the entire criminal operation. However, based off of the fact that um, he was the only one interviewed, that's what the, what the investigation went with, and that's how they uh, let him go and cut him loose. But I do believe that as prosecutors, we do have an ethical duty. If we recognize a defendant as a trafficking victim and their charged criminal conduct is a byproduct of the victimization, we should always, um, we should be the ones that want to advocate for their affirmative defense that shields them from the prosecution and potentially drop the charges. And Kate's going to talk about some more of that later. But we do know we have a spectrum of options when it comes to resolving and how we figure out how to resolve our case, whether it be determining that they are more victim um, than culpable um, and how we determine that mostly a victim, not fully capable, or whether there's mitigation. Um, or sometimes in that situation where you see that they are mostly culpable. We have to react and respond accordingly. Um, so our plea considerations, like we talked about, are all the different things we want to perceive. Um, again, it's the same thing that we want to talk about when we were coming up with how we want to get that mitigating information, and all things to consider as you move forward in determining how to truly affect and impact the victim. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Kate so that she can um, discuss a little further about some of our other options. Thank you, Dahlia. Um, so, you know, just to recap, um, to answer sort of one of the questions that we set out to answer, what kinds of charges do trafficking survivors face 
other than prostitution, the answer is any potential charge, right? There are many different things. Dahlia went through so many of them that where someone's experience being victimized leads to their arrest and prosecution for criminal conduct. That can be for drug offenses, for theft offenses, for nonviolent offenses, violent offenses, and Dahlia did a great job explaining exactly how that comes to be. So once, we're, once we have someone that's in the criminal legal system and we are working on considering all the factors that Dahlia has laid out about culpability, um, one thing we always seem to come back to in the criminal legal system is, well, let's make this person who is you know, saying that they are a victim and they have experienced victimization cooperate against someone. This seems to be the ultimate litmus test about whether someone is truly a victim is can we then go and get someone else? Um, and this exclusive focus is harmful. It's harmful because it does not line up with um, the actual complexity and nuance of the cases that Dolly was describing. It creates a binary system where people are forced to make choices um, that may be dangerous for them, that um, sort of jeopardizes the legitimacy of the resulting investigations and prosecutions. And granted, our, our whole criminal legal system in, in many ways is built on this notion of cooperation and sort of using people to facilitate other people's prosecution um, and criminalization. But I'm going to encourage us to step away from this for a second and think about what other resolutions can we work towards that don't require cooperation against someone else as part of a successful resolution of a case? And where do we see that, that exclusive focus, that sort of stronghold of the notion of cooperation doing harm in our system? Um, for those of you that, that work in the criminal legal system, I encourage you to just think of your own practice and the way in which cooperation always does seem to serve as that litmus test and why that is so limiting um, in, in accomplishing the results that Dahlia ha has described as our kind of collective goals. So um, thinking about a specific case uh, might be helpful for, for us to work through at this point, although we will work through quickly as we're <laughs> nearing the end of the hour. Um, but in a, this hypothetical, we'll have a minor who is going to be 15 years old who's charged with robbery with a weapon, which is a violent offense, and so this young person is prosecuted as an adult in many jurisdictions across the country. Um, this young person has no prior arrest history or family court history, and the allegations involve that the young person was used as the bait or advertisement to lure a person to a location where that person, the complainant in the case, is robbed at gunpoint. And in, in, you're assigned the case as the defender, and quickly in meeting with your client, you learn that this was an ongoing scheme that involved posting ads for commercial sex services on the internet. When people would respond to those ads, they would be brought to a location or respond to a location thinking that they were going to have a commercial sex date um, and instead were encountered by other people, not your client, um, who would rob them at gunpoint. Um, so as a defender in this case, you quite quickly identify, well, there's a young person involved who may be involved in commercial sex. Um, although this isn't a prostitution charge, this seems to me that there may be some element of exploitation here and something that we need to explore further. And getting to know your client, speaking with your client, speaking with your client's family, you come to understand that your client actually was um, it, being coerced to participate in these offenses by a group of older people that, with whom she just desperately, desperately, desperately wanted to fit in. Um, one of the older people she had a sort of romantic interest in, and he was the one that, that did spend more time attempting to bring her into this group. Um, she wants to fit in. Um, she does not want to provide any information about the other people in the group to law enforcement, to the prosecutor in her case, but she is very really facing state prison as a result of her arrest. From the prosecutor's perspective, what are the considerations here? You have a violent offense. You have a victim who has called the police, reported the offense, and wants to see some sort of proceeding result. But you recognize that this is a young person and there may be some sort of extenuating or mitigating circumstances here. As the judge presiding over the case similarly, right, reaching the right outcome here and understanding all this depends on, I guess, um, a sense of obligations to, to, you know, adjudicate a serious felony offense in a manner that seems consistent with, with uh, 
practice in your jurisdiction, but also I imagine as the judge, you're gonna to wanna to know about this young person. And this is where things start to get complicated, right? Because this is where the court system can sort of do one of two things. It can process this case in the normal traditional manner of adjudicating cases, which is sort of impersonal, doesn't really consider the circumstances and may in fact result in a prison sentence for this young person. On the other hand, to get at what is actually happening in the young person's life, their involvement in this offense, their level of culpability, all of the factors that Dahlia has gone through involves a certain level of intrusion that also in and of itself can become problematic for the young person. So what is the right balance here? Um, a lot depends obviously on the specific sentencing and dispositional alternatives in the jurisdiction, um, but it's worth noting that every stakeholder in this process is gonna come at it with a very specific perspective and a set of outcomes. As the defender, you know, you may be connecting your client to services, be, be sort of working with the family and recognize the need to be maybe less acute than it appears to a prosecutor or a judge. Balancing those interests and balancing the level of intrusion and sort of supervision and monitoring that then result from the prosecution are all reflective of the considerations that Dahlia has laid out. Um, so in thinking about alternative dispositions, I think one of the most important takeaways that I can um, emphasize here is that we can become more comfortable with outcomes that involve simply non-charging, declining to prosecute cases, um, or dismissing cases once they're initiated and prosecuted under the right circumstances. We are not limited as Dahlia laid out by the initial assessment, the initial interview, the initial fact gathering and posture of the case, even if in the unlikely event that you are in fact prosecuting Kaiser Soze, there is not one bite at the apple. And we have to sort of resist the notion that people and cases must be adjudicated so quickly um, and with finality in such a way that the real circumstances of what's happening don't come to light. So when we craft outcomes and we think about plea negotiations or lesser included offenses, right? Allowing someone to plead guilty to a lesser offense as part of a plea bargaining, deferred sentences, alternatives to incarceration, all of this can inform the ultimate outcome of a case. But the reality is we cannot be scared to say, whether we're a prosecutor, a judge, I don't think many defenders would be scared to say this to begin with, but we'll put them in there also. Listen, the person that we are prosecuting here the defendant in this case shouldn't be prosecuted. And as a result, we're going to simply dismiss this case. Um, we can craft dispositions that can change over time, right, as more information emerges. And so again, just resisting the urge or the impulse to see dispositions as final um, and immediate. We're, we are also thinking about what other kinds of laws uh, in your jurisdiction might influence your, your, the range of options in your toolkit. And so thinking specifically about, for young people, safe harbor laws. Um, almost every state has a safe harbor law now, which applies to juveniles who are engaged in commercial sex activity. In many states, these safe harbor laws sort of dictate that the young person, once they're identified as a young person engaging in commercial sex, should be treated in a non-criminal proceeding, um, meaning in states that have sort of a non-criminal track for juvenile adjudications and a criminal track, they should be considered non-criminal and provided services. A disclaimer about services is a word that's um, a phrase that's overused in terms of thinking about ways to address human trafficking and particularly people who've experienced human trafficking and some specificity is always welcome about what kinds of services are most useful and most needed. A lot of the time the services that are needed are housing related or um, services that actually would work to address some of the conditions of vulnerability that led to people being exploited in the first place. Many states also now have um, affirmative defenses for victims of trafficking in their criminal codes. Um, what this means is that at the time of prosecution, a victim of trafficking can assert or present a defense to their criminal behavior if the offense occurred as a result of their trafficking victimization. In many states, this is limited to prostitution offenses alone. And there are a lot of reasons why in most instances, these affirmative defenses won't actually be utilized by people facing criminal charges. 
but they're an important step in recognizing the connection and overlap of all the things that we're talking about here today. One jurisdiction to consider is Wisconsin, uh, where the affirmative defense in Wisconsin law actually applies to any offense committed as a direct result of human trafficking. And I think what's nice to look at in the language here is, is the statute, the law makes clear that this is without regard to whether anyone was prosecuted or convicted for human trafficking. So going back to that notion of cooperation and where we require cooperation, um, this affirmative defense makes clear that someone can, can establish that they are a victim without someone else having been prosecuted or convicted for whatever crime was committed against them. So this is a brand new uh, part or a, a development area of development in criminal law, and we are waiting to see how many of these cases play out with affirmative defenses. Um, a lot remains to be seen about how courts will interpret these provisions, what they will require victims of trafficking to prove in order to show that they're a victim such that an affirmative defense is warranted, um, and how juries and other, you know, other stakeholders will see um, the affirmative defenses in actual cases. A huge portion of this also, um, we could not do a webinar about the criminalization of trafficking survivors without talking about criminal record relief laws. And this, again, is another emerging and relatively recent um, area of criminal law and criminal procedure in the U.S. Um, as we know from any work touching on the criminal legal system, when someone has been arrested and has a criminal history or, or arrest history as a result of their own arrest, that conviction or arrest history can prevent them from obtaining employment and receiving certain kinds of assistance, such as housing, accessing education, um, it impacts public benefits and other financial stability. Financial stability. For survivors of trafficking, there's a whole other dimension of this where criminal records um, that were imposed on them as a result of their victimization also carry with them a huge emotional weight um, and severely impact and restrict their ability to move forward in their lives. In recognition of this, in 2009, New York became the first state to allow survivors of human trafficking to go back into criminal court and petition to have certain criminal records cleared, vacated, undone if they could show that, that, that those arrests and prosecutions and convictions, meaning times they were found guilty or pled guilty in court, were a result of having been a victim of trafficking. In the years since 2009, almost every state in the country has passed some form of relief for trafficking survivors who have been arrested and prosecuted and have records resulting from those arrests. I always need to point out, because we haven't fixed this map yet, that Minnesota actually does have a law for survivors of all kinds of crimes that allows expungement of certain charges from their records. So I wanna make one correction on the map, but what you'll see here is these laws have proliferated across the country over the last many years. Um, we recently re released a report, we being me <laughs> and the Polaris Project, um, uh, rating each state's criminal record relief laws and looking at what are the essential elements of these laws that need to be in place in order for survivors to meaningfully get relief from their criminal records. Um, it's worth noting that the report covers the types of offenses that should be vacated, how survivors move through the process, who gets to decide how information is protected, and how we are striving to leave people as complete as possible after the process. Um, it's also worth noting that Nebraska got the best score in our report card um, rankings. And, and the score, the best score you should see is an 81 or a B. Um, we had discussed curving the rankings um, such that, you know, a certain number of states would get A's, but we actually thought it was important to reflect the reality that these laws, again, like affirmative defenses, like safe harbor laws, are a first step, but are actually not quite in the place yet that we need them to be to ensure that criminalized survivors have relief. Um, I think at this point, I've hit three o'clock on the dot, um, and so I wanna make sure that we get to any questions that have been posted, although I don't know if there are, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Megan or Zoe for that purpose.
Thanks so much, Kate. Yeah, we um, have not received any questions, um, so we can wrap up now. Um, if any questions occur to folks, feel free to reach out to us at mosaicsandamerican.edu. In the meantime, thank you all so much for participating. Please do fill out the feedback form on uh, your way out of the webinar, and please log on to our website to see the topic of our upcoming fourth quarterly webinar. Thanks so much to everyone, participants and panelists alike. Goodbye.